Big Easy. NOLA baby, New Orleans has to be the party capital of America. So even though the Eagles are struggling, it's hard to be sad in this city. You feel the voodoo juju immediately when you step foot in its quarters. The past isn't dead. It's not even the past. No other city in America keeps its history as vital or as accessible as New Orleans. Entire neighborhoods, whole buildings, cemetery crypts, manhole covers, cobblestone streets, and ancient oaks serve as touchstones to vanished eras. In New Orleans, history can strut as loudly as a carnival walking crew or creep as softly as a green lizard on a courtyard wall. Thrilling, colorful, tragic, inspiring. Discover a little about the sweep of the city's history. La Nouvelle Orleans has French and Spanish roots. Spain took control of New Orleans in 1763 after the signing of the Treaty of Paris, which left lasting marks on the city's street names and architecture. In 1800, the Spanish ceded Louisiana back to France, but Napoleon sold the city in what was the Louisiana Territory to the United States three years later as a part of the $15 million Louisiana Purchase, April 30th, 1803. Although the French sold Louisiana, the native residents held tight to their Francophile ways. The Creoles, the American-born offspring of European settlers, many with French blood, created a sophisticated and cosmopolitan society in colonial New Orleans. From the streets of the French Quarter, to Creole cottages, history of the French still remain. As Americans prospered, the French and Creoles of New Orleans still socially rejected the nouveau riche American plantation owners. So the Americans simply stayed across the neutral ground of Canal Street and carved out their own neighborhoods. From what is now the Central Business District, the Warehouse District, and all the way up through the Garden District and Uptown. In the mid-1800s, the highest concentration of millionaires in America could be found between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, fortunes fueled by the slave economy and massive sugar plantations along the Mississippi River. In the 1850s alone, Louisiana sugar plantations produced an estimated 450 million pounds of sugar per year, worth more than $20 million annually. Yet these elegant mansions hid the misery of the enslaved and could not shelter fortunes from the coming storm that divided the nation. War destroyed the world of antebellum New Orleans, but much remains to uncover today. In the late 19th century, jazz emerged, combining ragtime, blues, spirituals, and the American songbook into something brand new and soul-stirring. Music is a birthright in New Orleans, and it's always been that way. The French, Spanish, African, Italian, German, and Irish found common ground in their love of listening to and making music. While the 1920s is considered the jazz age in America, in New Orleans, that age dawned in the late 1800s. While the Roaring Twenties were in full swing, New Orleans roared back, ignoring prohibition and welcoming travelers. It was a time of cultural excitement. Artists, authors, and the adventurous discovered the French Quarter. NOLA provided the soundtrack of the decade. But if you ask any millennial, New Orleans was the soundtrack of the 2000s. With hip-hop legend Lil Wayne's peak of his career and his native Louisiana rap group, The Hot Boys. There's just so much different stuff you can do in this city, but I try to do the best I can when I visit. You have the Creole style of food with gumbo, which is so good. The Cajun style with po'boys and jambalaya, which is considered more of a country style of cooking, but equally as tasty. If you're in New Orleans and not getting beignets, then you're doing New Orleans completely wrong. But if you're a Popeyes fan, you gotta get it from the source. Louisiana kitchen style. The cuisine in New Orleans and Louisiana as a whole has subtle differences, but those differences are institutional in what makes the Creoles and Cajuns their separate entities. It's always a party down here on Bourbon Street. It's a must in the day or nighttime to get drunk and have a good time. It's a madhouse 24-7, 365. But if you want to go off the beaten path a little bit to get the more low-key vibe with music, Frenchman Street, which is farther down on the French Quarter, is the way to go. A street where you can see artists putting on a great act with jazz and modern tunes. It's a really great time.
Everyone knows New Orleans loves to party, but we haven't talked about how they are the epicenter for the largest party of the year. Mardi Gras, or Fat Tuesday. While Eagles fans were partying in Chicago on January 6th, New Orleans was celebrating the start of Mardi Gras season with Twelfth Night, where three parades take place. I could see the community was priming themselves for Mardi Gras on March 6th. Houses were covered in green, purple, and gold, beads hanging on fences, flags flying, masks mounted, everything. In 1703, America celebrated its very first Mardi Gras in Mobile, Alabama. By the 1730s, Mardi Gras was celebrated openly in New Orleans, but not with the same parades we know today. In 1875, the Mardi Gras Act made Fat Tuesday a legal holiday in Louisiana, which it still is. In 1892, purple for justice, green for faith, and gold for power. Most Mardi Gras crews today develop from private social clubs with restrictive membership policies. Since all of these parade organizations are completely funded by their members, New Orleans call it the greatest free show on earth. Louisiana is a unique state. Its natural geography also makes a great home for alligators in the bayou. Louisiana's bayous encompass nearly 3 million acres and are home to some of the most unique ecosystems and societies on the planet. These shallow bodies of water, often called swamps, appear stagnant. The bayous play a major role in Louisiana's economy as a source of natural resources and a destination for tourists. Being that I'm still a tourist, I wanted to make sure I saw a gator with my own two eyes. I hopped on a swamp tour boat for gator spotting, and I wasn't disappointed. Not only did I catch a glimpse of an actual gator in the bayou, but the tour guide brought out a baby gator for everyone to hold. I was nervous at first, but this was a once in a lifetime opportunity to hold one in my hands. Many of Louisiana's bayou residents, called Cajuns, speak a form of French unique to the region. The Cajun lifestyle encompasses a mixture of Creole and homespun culture, which has produced distinctive styles of music, dance, and cooking. Cajun music, called Zydeco, includes the elements of the diverse origins and backgrounds of the people who have inhibited the bayous, encompassing African rhythms, American jazz, and Canadian folk songs. Louisiana's coastal wetlands serve as a natural barrier that protects inland areas from massive destruction that come from tropical storms and hurricanes. But in 2005, one hurricane famously ran through Louisiana's natural defenses. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish I had better news for you, but we are facing a storm uh, that most of us have feared. I do not want to create panic, but I do want the citizens to understand that this is very serious and it's of the highest nature. And it's, that's why we're taking this unprecedented move. The storm is now a Cat 5, a Category 5, as I appreciate it, with sustained winds of 150 miles an hour, with wind gusts of 190 miles per hour. The storm surge most likely will topple uh, our levee system. So we are preparing uh, to deal with that also. So that's why we're ordering a mandatory evacuation. This morning, the Superdome is already open for people with special needs. We want you to expeditiously uh, move to the Superdome. At noon today, the Superdome will then, then be opened up as a, as a refuge of last resort, where we will start to take citizens that cannot evacuate. Hundreds of thousands of people in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama were displaced from their homes, causing more than $100 billion in damage. Many people believed that the federal government was slow to meet the needs of the people affected by the storm. George Bush doesn't care about black people. New Orleans was at a particular risk, though about half of the city actually lies above sea level. Its average elevation is about six feet below sea level and is completely surrounded by water. Neighborhoods that sat below sea level, many of which housed the city's poorest and most vulnerable people, were at a great risk of flooding. Eventually, nearly 80% of the city was under some quantity of water. Before the storm, the city's population was mostly black, about 67%. Moreover, 
nearly 30% of its people lived in poverty. Katrina worsened these conditions and left many of New Orleans' poor citizens even more vulnerable than they had been before the storm. Even with hardship still prevalent, a local favorite in the seventh ward reigned supreme in soul food, Triangle Deli, a small food spot connected to a gas station. It reminded me of my grandmother's cooking during the holidays. Some people need to realize that sometimes the best food comes from the most uncommon places. This gas station was serving gas.